uh, the final bounty hunter in the United States. Uh, his name is Daw. Yeah, he's an unbelievable man. And he was locked up for uh, attempted murder or, or I guess conspiracy to murder, even though he was not guilty about 20 years ago. Welcome to show two of the truth about the martial arts business. I'm your host, John Graydon. Today, we have part two of my interview with the Bruce Lee of motivation, Tony Robbins. In this episode, Tony shares some amazing stories of people who have overcome huge obstacles to succeed, including Dog the Bounty Hunter. So let me know what you think. Please don't forget to subscribe below and share this with your friends. Thanks very much. I want to touch on your own involvement in the martial arts at six foot seven, somehow I don't feel self-defense was your motivation. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, not exactly. Um, actually, um, I've always been interested in martial arts. I originally wanted to, I studied a little bit of Aikido, and I just like the art. I like the idea of aligning and redirecting versus, you know, breaking somebody. It's just, uh, I think, a different style of thinking. Yeah, yeah, yes. And so, but I, I had the privilege of meeting uh, Grandmaster Jun Ri, who's mm -hmm. kind of the father of, of Taekwondo in the United States. He's trained about 125 congressmen, and uh, he taught a great deal of kicks to uh, Bruce Lee, and most people aren't aware of that, but mm -hmm. I got a chance to meet Mrs. Lee, and she gives him credit, so it's, it's really neat. But the thing of the matter is that um, when I met him, I was so impressed with him as an individual. Uh, martial arts for me, it wasn't about kicking or punching or learning mm -hmm. how to do that because I, you know, there's no, I don't have a lot of fear that I'm going to get in the fight. Or yeah. People don't usually pick on a six foot seven person. <laughs> I'm sure there's some exceptions, but I don't seem to fall into those categories. Mm -hmm. And because I also believe that there is no situation that you can't disarm yeah. with your mind. Uh, recently, I had the privilege um, of interviewing a man I've known for about five years, and he is uh, the final bounty hunter in the United States. Uh, his name is Daw. Yeah. yeah, he's an unbelievable man. And he was locked up for uh, attempted murder or, or, I guess, conspiracy to murder, even though he was not guilty about 20 years ago, I guess 15 years ago. And um, what he went through was unbelievable. But his capacity, since he's a felon, and right, rightly or wrongly, mm -hmm. he cannot carry a gun. He's caught over 3,700 people in the last eight years. I mean, to give you an idea, if you're a top, you know, investigator, you're a guy with the FBI, something like that, who's really good, you might catch three or four or five people a month. I mean, if you're good, he gets just, he brings in two or three at a time. No, because you say it's more than one a day. Oh, yeah. It's more than one a day. <laughs> and, what he, and sometimes you bring like six or seven and all chained together, and they're like, <laughs> and it's like, and, but he is so brilliant, and yeah. he doesn't have a gun. So Amazing. he goes in there, and it's all his mind. So I didn't want to learn martial arts so I could be a better at punching and kicking. Yeah. I got involved in martial arts because I respected Master Reese so much, and I wanted a discipline that I felt would be uh, increase my, my conditioning and also just be a, uh, even more mental focused. And Master Reese, um, I have to tell you, of, of all the people I've met in martial arts, he's one of the people I respect the most, not just because he was my master, but because um, he really wants to improve the quality of people's lives. Yeah. His whole goal is to create increased happiness for people, which most people when they talk about martial arts, that's not necessarily the major focus, to be in shape or protect yourself or defend, or for some people, unfortunately, yeah. it becomes ego. And then they lose the whole purpose of martial mm -hmm. arts. It's not who can kick higher, it's how can you demand more from yourself? You're growing and expanding. That really is a responsibility of the instructor to guide that student. And even the first to align and redirect. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think most instructors do that. But I think it's kind of hard uh, for an instructor to do that if the person is not committed. And I think that, you know, the instructor can only do so much. You know, I've seen a lot of great instructors, and I've seen a few of the people come out who aren't that great. Well, the person wasn't committed. And But what I would do is I would challenge the instructor and the individual. Mm -hmm. I would say, if you really want to enjoy the martial arts, uh, change the game. Change your metaphor. The metaphors we have for things shape the way we think. Uh, if you have a metaphor that says, small leaks sink the ship, like I remember a lady who was in one yeah. of my seminars once, she drove everybody crazy. She's always like, what's the matter with this? Wait, wait what's the matter with that? I mean, she's good. She, everybody, she hated, everybody hated her guts. Yeah. Um, people in relationships <laughs> have got weird metaphors. They, you know, instead of, you know, I'm going home to be with my lover, they yeah. say, I'm going home to be with the old man, the old, the old woman. And one woman called her husband the prince of darkness. That doesn't build for a great relationship. <laughs> no, so what we have to do in martial arts is we've got to see what is it. Is martial arts for you a dance? You know, is it a war? I think if it's a war, you got the wrong metaphor. You know, is it a discipline? For a long what time. is it? And we all have our own metaphors, but yeah. we need to find out what the metaphor is that makes us every day want to go out and hold ourselves to a higher level and enjoy the process, not just hold ourselves to a level so we're so damn disciplined. What we need to do is make sure that martial arts give us joy. Yeah. So with Master Ree, I really have experienced that throughout the years. I've experienced great joy. Now, I made the mistake that I think some people do. I wanted to go do my, my black belt, and I want to do it in the record time, you know, and just, you know, show 
people could be done because I built my career and going to the army and saying, give me anything you guys do, I'll cut the train time in half and increase the comp of the CIA. Mm -hmm. And I succeeded every time. So a lot of my identity and ego was caught up in that. So I did it. I did it in eight and a half months. And I mean, and he brought in people from other schools to make sure, man, there was no question that I was where it was. He didn't give me any favorites and stuff. <laughs> I was real intense about it. But, you know, I overtrained and I injured yeah. myself. And it's, it's like you've got to make sure that you understand that what we're doing this for is a variety of things. But you better make sure you're healthful in the process. Because I know a lot of guys that are fit, but they're not healthy. Jim Fix, the runner, he was fit. He's also dead. <laughs> you know, yeah. He died on the run. Fitness is strength, intensity, mm -hmm. the ability in an instant to do something. But health is the balance of the mind, the emotion, the spirit, the biochemistry, all together working together in a way that allows you to continuously do that. And I think that as a martial artist, we have a responsibility to ourselves, as well as hopefully as role model, to show people that you don't have to become a fanatic to love what you do, be the best at what you do, that your life can be balanced, that um, you can be a totally committed martial artist who commits your time and energy there, but you're out in the community making a difference at Thanksgiving. That's, or you're out there touching other people's lives mm -hmm. who aren't into martial arts. You, I think a lot of people make what we do into like a cult. And I think that hurts us. Because then people say, oh man, I don't want to do martial arts because do that, i got to like change my identity. I know from my experience that a lot of our viewers are out there thinking, boy, karate looks neat. You know, I really need to get in shape. I've been thinking about doing karate since I was a kid. But they pro procrastinate. They put it off. They have certain fears. How would you address that? I think the best way to deal with procrastination is put it off. <laughs> no, seriously. I, I think you got to look at why people procrastinate. What is procrastination? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's when you know you should do something, but you still don't do it. You just what I call shit all over yourself. You know, <laughs> over and over again, you say, I should, I should, I should, I should, but you don't do it. You don't follow through. So what that really comes down to is understanding that what drives all human behavior is the need to avoid pain and or the desire to gain pleasure. I mean, that's what drives everything. I don't care if I walk up to a lady and say, you're wearing makeup today, huh? Mm -hmm. How come? Why'd you put on the makeup? Do you love the process of putting this crap on each day? <laughs> I doubt it, right? But instead, what you'll say is, well, it makes me feel good. That's right, it gives you pleasure. Mm -hmm. Why does it make you feel good? Well, I don't know, I feel more attractive or I feel other people are more attracted to me. Sometimes they say, well, I really didn't want to put it on this morning. You know, sometimes I wake up in the morning and say, how come men don't have to do this? Yeah. And I say, well, why don't you do it? And usually it's because they're afraid, well, if they don't put on the makeup, somebody's going to say, what happened to your face? So they're trying to avoid pain or they're trying to get pleasure, and men do the same thing. Of course. And so yeah, a procrastination example might be, you know, here you are knowing you should do something, but your brain is saying, you know what, doing this right now will be more painful than just putting it off. But there are some times where all of a sudden it switches. Yeah. Where suddenly somebody says, i got to get a martial arts, or somebody says, i got to do something. Usually around April 14th, your procrastination <laughs> disappears. Because all of a sudden your brain says, not doing this right now will be much more painful than just doing it. So what we've got to do, though, is learn to do that consciously instead of waiting for the environment to do it. In other words, we've got to learn to link and control what we link pain and pleasure to. See, in a relationship, somebody gets in a relationship, and a lot of times people say, I want to be in a relationship. Then they get in one, they go, I don't want to be in a relationship. Mm -hmm. What they wanted was love or intimacy or connection. Yeah. But now what they do is they've had some disappointments, some frustrations. Yeah. I don't care if it's in martial arts and, mm -hmm. or in a relationship didn't work out. Then what happens is now the brain starts going, this could be painful. I don't know if I want to do this. And so they take two steps forward and one step back. Martial arts, there's pain in what we do. I mean, there's no doubt about You've it. you got to come to class. But one of the challenges is that unless you want to go through the short-term pain, you never get the big pleasure. And most people in life, and they're trying to avoid short-term pain, do things like smoke or yeah. drink, kind of habits that literally create long-term pain or end their destiny mm -hmm. in a shorter period of time. What we're offering people, I think, through martial arts is a way of life. And people are a little concerned about change, like a way of life. What if it changes my life? What will it mean? Will I be doing less and I'll lose my identity? What I think people have to do is be willing to expose themselves initially and get a taste. If they get a taste, the experience that we have, mm -hmm. I think, is so pleasurable yes. as we develop mastery of the power, the ability to impact, the respect, the whole way of life of martial arts enhances people if they're willing to do it for enough time to get past that initial stage. I think most people, though, operate out of what I call a dabbler frame. They jump into anything brand new. And in the beginning, there's so much to learn. Right? I mean, there's so many different things, and it's really exciting because you go from being a total neophyte to, wow, you've got all these yeah. skills. But then there comes a point, as you know, discipline kicks in. where mastery mm -hmm. requires discipline and where it doesn't seem like you're growing at the same level. I, I, for somebody who's not familiar with martial arts, maybe use a more generic metaphor mm -hmm. like tennis. In the beginning, the first few days, boy, I mean, you didn't even know how to hit it. Now you're hitting it, and you can keep score. Yeah. I mean, this is really cool. Awesome. But after a while, yeah. you play twice as hard, and you're yeah. practicing like crazy, and you don't make the same jump mm -hmm. progress mm -hmm. visibly. In fact, in order to do well, somebody comes by one day, your coach says, you know what, as good as that feels and as good as you are, to go to the next level, you got to take the racket and you got to turn it just a little bit like this. And you go, what? That feels weird. No. And then if you go try and use what they teach you, you mm -hmm. actually, just like a martial arts, sometimes you drop down your skill a little bit. Graph dips. 
Exactly. And what happens is they go, oh, no, I'm not going to do I'm going to go back the old way, and they never grow. So what I try to do, or they quit, what I try to do is inc really encourage mastery. Mastery is somebody who understands that in order to continue to grow, there are going to be times where you have to take a step back to take five steps forward. And that step back, though, is with a coach, the sensei, with someone who's been there before you who can guide you, and you've got to trust that person. If you don't, you should be dealing with them. Well, that's the so, beauty of the martial arts. You know, we say as black belts that if we could have a ghost of Christmas future yeah. and take a brand-new student to the future to black belt and yes. the feeling, the personal power it has and how it's enhanced your life, they would never miss a class. I so agree. There's any I way agree. of doing that. And what we're talking about really is communication. Yes. Uh, communicating, of course, with your instructor, but mainly communicating with yourself. I agree. Touch I, on that. Your whole life is controlled by that. I, I uh, spent a good deal of my life studying people who I think have become extremely successful in the culture and trying to pull from them core beliefs and strategies. And... Um, you know, I, I often will get people, I have a friend named W. Mitchell, who years ago was in a car accident, and actually a motorcycle accident, and three-quarters of his body was burned off. And he woke up in searing pain, fearing to even breathe, and uh, everyone around him said, oh, my God, you know, he's going to die. He's not going to have a will to live. Well, he woke up, and he not only lived, but they thought, what's the matter with him? They must be giving him some pretty good drugs. They couldn't give him drugs. His mom came in and said, you know, I think it's, he just doesn't realize how bad it is. And today... 12, 15 years later, when I asked him, I said, you know, why are you so happy? He said, I guess I still haven't figured out how bad it is. You know? Amazing. And he also, though, that's not the end of the story, unfortunately, 10 years later, he went and started a company in Vermont. And it was his way of overcoming his fear. So he developed a wood-burning stove company and became the, one of the largest employers in the state of Vermont. He became a millionaire. He learned to fly an airplane. His hands were burned all the way off down to the knuckles. His I would say at this point, he's still seriously disfigured. Oh, for the rest of his life. Oh, my goodness. But he learned how to fly with these little special devices on his plane, and he flew for five or six years. One day he was in Colorado, and he didn't go through his checklist, kind of like a martial artist who doesn't warm up, doesn't, warm doesn't up. do the things that are necessary, mm -hmm. and they think it's not going to cost him. He gets off, there's a little thing on the wing, and sure enough, wham, he goes down and crashes from about 300 feet. Three people walk away, he's not one of them. Oh. He's paralyzed from the waist down for oh. life now. Oh. So now here he oh. is, paralyzed from the waist down. They cut off his toes and sew them on his hands so he has something to grab with, because he's goodness. never going to use his legs again. And everyone around him was like depressed out of their mind. And I said, what pulled you through that? What did you think when you were down there? Because I want to study how he talked because he's such a happy, successful yeah. guy. Incredible. And he said, well, he said, there's this really attractive nurse. And I kept asking myself, what would it take to get a date with her? <laughs> this guy is like burned beyond recognition. How come? How could he think this way? And you know what? Two years later, we married her. Oh, my. I mean, you ask a question, you get an answer. I and mean, we've all heard asking, you shall receive. But we don't realize how true that is of the human brain. Oh. But the reason he did it, he has a core belief. This is a belief we all need to offer ourselves. And that is that there is no absolute relationship between any two experiences or events, i.e., being burned beyond recognition is not determined whether or not you can attract the woman of your dreams or man of your dreams. That, i.e., not having your legs does not mean you can't contribute. He ended up running for lieutenant governor of Colorado. He placed third, but he beat out five other people. He, he was running on real issues. He wore a badge or, or his, his campaign button said, send me to the governor's mansion and it won't just be another pretty face. <laughs> He's an incredible guy. And now I brought him in to speak to one of my groups six years ago. And oh. as a result, that started a new career. Now he's a public speaker all over the nation. So we need to realize, I mean, the theme of my book is Awaken the Giant Within. We mm -hmm. need to realize we've got the power inside to do whatever we want. But what we have to do is make some decisions. We have to decide what we're up for. We have to decide what we're committed to. We have to decide that the past does not equal the future. And just because we've tried all these things in the past that haven't worked doesn't mean this won't. And we have to decide to commit to mastery, that we're not going to dabble, that when we get to that point where you know, we're working real hard and we don't get the same level of reward, we've got to know that we will get the reward if we continue. Every great success in martial arts, mm -hmm. business, and any kind of career is someone who has gone beyond. When life comes and tests you, puts up the wall and says, who's willing to push through it? And most people hit the wall two or three times and give up. I hit the wall, I smack it again, I try to climb over it, go under it, and I'll just keep going until I do. Through the same way. That, that, yeah, exactly, exactly. Whatever it takes. That concludes part two of my interview with Tony Robbins. Next week, we wrap it up with part three. Here's our Teach Like a Pro tip of the week. These lessons are straight from the Mata Certification course at matacertification.com. This week, the Principles of an Authoritative Instructor, Module 1, Lesson 4, No Rescues. When you ask a question to a student or to the class, make sure you know what the minimum acceptable answer is. Too often we see instructors ask a question and then finish the answer for the student. For instance, the instructor asks, what is integrity? Sally. Sally says, um... Integrity is when you do something good, and the instructor says, right, when you do something good, whether or not someone is watching. Good job, Sally. Sally didn't answer the question. 
the instructor answered it for her and then told her that she did a good job. That is not teaching. That's called pulling up or rescuing the student. The message to the student is that half answers are considered good jobs. Teach the exact answer to the question and repeat it enough so there is no excuse for Sally to only know half of the answer. No rescues. That, as they say, is that. Thanks so much for listening. Please remember to subscribe and then share this podcast with your friends. And if you feel so inclined, a five-star review would be greatly appreciated. You can always email me at john at johngraden.com or click the start recording button to send me an audio message that I can share in a future podcast. A very special thank you to Pasco EDU Smart Start, Cobra Defense Systems, and Sports and Fitness Insurance for their sponsorship. Thanks very much. I hope you'll join us on the next episode.